Blunder Pit. Chapter 8. A Second Search. Sergeant Eve was tall, stiff and dark. He asked a great many questions and especially of Rachel. Did your husband come up to bed before you were asleep? He asked. We came up the same time, sir. We nearly always do. You went to sleep at once? Yes, said Rachel. And so did Jan. And you never woke till morning. Rachel agreed. Then your husband might have gone out any time in the night without your knowing it. Again, Rachel said yes. Eve let Rachel go and then questioned Clive about the sounds he had heard. Clive was quite definite. He had heard a sound like a door being closed. And it was loud enough to wake you. It seems funny it didn't rouse anyone else except perhaps John Otter. My room is nearest the stairs and my door was ajar, Clive told him. Eve questioned everyone in the house, including Wanda, then went into Mr. Harriet's study and talked to him for some time. Afterwards, Torgan drove him back. Wanda went in to see her father and came out, looking very bothered. The sergeant thinks Jan went off on his own account, she said indignantly to the boys. Did you ever hear such nonsense? Went off on his own account, Clive repeated. I don't understand. He thinks he's run away. He believes that Rachel let him out and locked the door behind him. He asked Dad if anything was missing. Silly ass, cried Clive. I bet your father sent him off with a flea in his ear. Yes, Dad told him that Jan was not only his servant but his friend, and that he would as soon suspect himself as he would Jan. So Eve got his back up and said stiffly that he would make inquiries and notify other stations. Fat lot of good that will do, Clive exclaimed angrily. If Jan's to be found, we've got to find him ourselves. That is my opinion also. The three turned in surprise to see Major Garnet standing behind them. Yes, Medland, that policeman is a fool, the Major continued in his precise voice. I am inclined to think that Otter has either been taken by force or decoyed away. I have spent the morning in investigations on my own, and this is what I have found. He took from his pocket an old-fashioned coloured cotton handkerchief and held it out. Wanda took it quickly. It's Jan's, she said. Where, where did you find it, Major Garnet? Hanging in a gorse bush just beyond the bridge over the stream. It looks to me as if Otter had thrown or dropped it there on purpose. I did my best to find tracks, but was unable to do so. But your eyes are sharper than mine, and it may be that you would be more successful. At any rate, the effort would be worth a while. We'll have a try anyhow, said Chad. We'd better get along at once, Clive. All the same, I wish I knew which way to go. The Major glanced round as if to make sure no one was listening. My own impression is that the men who caught Otter were poachers. In that case, they would probably have some camp in that wild stretch of moor to the south. If I were you, I should climb the high ridge that is called Tor Royal. From there, you get a wide view. I would accompany you, but unfortunately my wounded leg is troubling me. Wanda put up some sandwiches for them, and ten minutes later, Chad and Clive were walking briskly towards the bridge which crossed the brook just above the harbour. They crossed the bridge and began to examine the ground, but the heat of the previous day had dried it pretty thoroughly, and in any case it was all grass and heather. They found no marks, so pushed straight on towards Tor Royal. It was rough going, and the heat was intense. They took off their coats and carried them and plugged along up hill and down making for the mighty ridge that towered against the skyline to the south. In the wide hollow below the tor lay a great bog where acres of liquid slime glistened like black ink in the sun blaze. The boys had to make a wide swing to the east to clear this. At the eastern end was a stretch of soft ground and, as they crossed his, Chad pulled up short and pointed to footmarks in the peat. Both boys stooped and examined them. Three sets, said Chad. One very big one, one very broad, and the third, Clive. These marks are just about Jan's size. Clive's eyes were bright as he looked at the marks. 
Just about, he agreed eagerly. Pon my Sam, it looks as if the Major was right and that Jan had been kidnapped. Chad frowned. But what for? What in the name of sense could anyone want with Jan? They might think he knows where the treasure is, Clive suggested. But how could they know anything about the treasure, Chad demanded. Wanda told us that she hadn't said a word to anyone but Jan and ourselves. And if she says so, you may bet it's true, Clive shrugged. It's no use making guesses. What we have to do is find Jan. Let's see if we can follow these tracks. Only thing we can do, Chad agreed. But I doubt if they'll carry us far. In this he was right, for, once off the soft ground, it would have taken a bloodhound to follow the trail over sheep, bitten turf, rocks and heather. So at last they turned and made for the top of the ridge, and by the time they reached it, their shirts were sticking to their backs. On the summit, however, they met a little breeze, and both dropped on a boulder and sat facing it, getting their breath back. The view was enormous. They could see right across the moor to the inn country beyond, while to the west they got a sight of miles of blue sea stretching to the blue horizon. They didn't waste time looking at the distances, but began to scan the moor beneath them. Clive caught Chad by the arm. What's that? he said, pointing to a deep little valley about a mile away. An old mine house, Chad told him. Isn't that the sort of place? He stopped short and drew a quick breath. There's a man coming out, going down to the brook. See? That's the end of chapter eight. Good night. Sleep tight.